Good morning, good afternoon, good night. Thanks for joining us on today's podcast of Conversation and Coffee with your co-host Gary Senna and I am Danny Vicente. Thank you for listening whenever, wherever, and however you are joining us. Conversations and Coffee is the place where we share a cup of coffee and allow our curiosity to sit in the driver's seat and explore topics in your industry. Everything from technology to leadership to innovation and so much more. So grab your favorite cup of coffee, sit back, laugh with us while we dive into the topics keeping you up at night. Well, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Thank you for joining another Conversation and Coffee. I am your host, Danny Vicente. And as mentioned last time, we do have a new host on the podcast. This is her second go-round. Uh, Sabrina, why don't you say hello to everyone? Hey, all Thank you all for joining us today. We're really excited to kind of go and dive into what I do for my day job at Cisco, which is <laughs> on the retail side. I love it. I love it. Uh, and some of you may, if you are watching this podcast on YouTube versus just listening, once you hear his voice, if you're listening, you're going to know exactly who this man is. We are joined again by Mark Scanlon, the infamous Mark Scanlon is joining, and we have a new voice to the podcast, and I'm going to let Rafi introduce himself and, and what brings you to the podcast. Sure. My name is uh, Rafi Vartin. I'm Vice President for Business Development at MelTX. We're uh, a partner on the computer vision side. Uh, with Meraki, specifically on the uh, intelligent cameras. Uh, we're on the podcast because we focus predominantly in retail uh, for our verticals, uh, and I've got a background in it, uh, and I talk a lot for a living, so I think that's part of it as well. I'm pretty used to talking. <laughs> you, you and I both, Frank. And Mark, actually, as we're going through introductions, even for those folks that do know you, why don't we remind them what you do and, and why you're here? Sure, and I may even ch have changed roles since the last time uh, we talked, Danny. Uh, so I am the uh, global lead for retail uh, in the Industry Solutions Group here at Cisco. Love it, love it. Well, you are always the global lead in my book, Fred. So, <laughs> <laughs> you sweet talking devil, you. <laughs> well, Mark, uh, uh, so so those of you that don't know, Mark and I have a long history of doing recordings, whether video or audio uh, with Cisco, and I am notorious for going off script. So I do want to show him I have the script here. We will remain on script, Mark. There's absolutely no way I'm going off script whatsoever. Um, and <laughs> so those of you that don't know, we did, a, we did a recording in New York for NRF, and that is actually how I broke the ice with Mark. We had a script down. I threw the script in the air and we winged it. <laughs> and it was one of one of the best videos we've done. So we're going to do a very similar thing here, Mark. Um, so I'm I'm going to kick it off with a very easy question, guys. And that is that is what is MeldCX? What what are we going to talk about today? And what's its what's its motion in, in retail? Sure. Um, so uh, I don't want to do the elevator pitch and stop at every level. So we'll go as high level as we can go. MelTX is uh, headquartered in Australia, founded about three and a half years ago, focusing on technology within the retail environment. Uh, one part of our business focuses on uh, device peripheral and application management. So we've got a middleware application. And the other part focusing on computer vision, which is a very broad term uh, that, te that basically takes video signals and turns it into data and that's a that's also a pretty big bucket right uh so in in the retail environment we're learning that there is a very large gap that retailers have of what's actually happening within their environment um they've been operating maybe many for dozens and dozens of years uh but they have uh found that during the pandemic in particular that there's a massive uh, lack of understanding of what's actually happening on an ongoing basis in their environment. So we're trying to teach them to utilize intelligent technology to learn more about how people behave, how their own associates behave in those environments, how we can do things like look at in stock or out of stock, because uh, that's been a massive problem within uh, the grocery market in particular. And so we're kind of trying to uncover all of the data that's hiding in plain sight. And you can't do that with some level of intelligence without some level of intelligence uh, at the edge. Um, and because it's going into the camera, we found out that we can get very scalable very quickly. Um, and so we've been in some very high level conversations incredibly fast. Um, hope that hope that helps. Is that a good Absolutely. overview? Absolutely. It does. Right. It yeah, does. Absolutely. And 
so I, I, I simplify it even more. Uh, so if we if we think about the e-com world, um, we've always known exactly where the customers come from, where they go on the website, what they look at, how long they look at it, uh, wh whether they consider it and put it in the basket, whether they you know move on to something else. Uh, does a promotion on the web page make a difference? You know, d to the conversion, all of that stuff uh, has been kind of intrinsic to the platform uh, within e-commerce, but not so much in the physical environment. Uh, we knew when people walked through the door, or rather, how many people walked through the door. We didn't know anything about them, and we know mm -hmm. how many people checked out uh, at the end. Uh, and that was pretty much it. It was a black box inside the store, unless you had some intern standing with a clipboard doing random intercepts and you know uh, scribbling things down. Um, this changes the game from from a retailer's perspective. And uh, there's there's studies that show that personalization uh, within the shopping journey can drive a, a forty percent larger basket. Uh, and to be able to personalize, you first need to understand the consumer. And that's what uh, computer vision and, and Mel CX uh, is able to do uh, for us and with us. Definitely. Mark, and you and I have also discussed more of like that video analytics portion, which is like that use case mainly that Mel CX does offer. So with more of that video analytics, but also that behavior analytics that goes kind of behind with that software as well. Well, let me take a let me take a bit of a step back to say one thing very clearly because there have been implementations of video within retail environments before. It's predominantly been focused on things like loss prevention. Okay, loss prevention is a very nice word, which is are people stealing things, right? And if so, how do I identify that they're stealing things? And then can I go backwards in time and bring that to law enforcement? So video has traditionally been backwards looking effectively that says, if something has happened in the last 90 days and I've recognized that some semblance of crime or something that bad has happened in my environment, can I go back and find it effectively, right? So, and, and that's, a, that's absolutely the right use case for folks that are looking at um, loss prevention from like a law enforcement perspective, which a lot of LP professionals are, right? Former FBI, former law enforcement, things along those lines. The question really is, is what could you do if you had information in real time about what was happening, but you weren't looking for individuals, meaning that we don't look at the face of the person, right? But if you understood more about metadata around an individual, and by metadata, I mean, is the person wearing a Nike shirt or basic demographic information, right? Or the times of days they come in, all the rest of those things. Does that data actually provide things that are valuable? And what we're finding is the answer to that is yes, it does. So we're at that point of uh, that, that proof of concept stage with a lot of retailers where they're like, um, I, I don't believe that this can actually be real. And then we say, well, we'll prove it to you, right? And they, they go, okay, prove it. And we say, okay, well, what are we proving? That's the first thing. We have to define what the thing is that we're proving. Is it that we're going to utilize cameras to look at cars going through a drive through right? And look at that, that use case. Is it going to be that we can bring, we can look at um, gaps in the shelf to do planogram compliance, things along those lines. And so we try to take a narrow approach and say, let's prove the narrow thing, but then we can look at the data around that narrow thing that gives us insights about what's actually happening within that environment. And Mark, you speak a lot about this, and I think it bears repeating about the idea of going from kind of insights to action. Maybe you want to kind of uh, touch on that for a second, because I think it's very valuable. Yeah, sure. It, it was a, a phrase or a series of words, I guess, uh, that uh, somebody used in a meeting a couple of years ago, and it, it stuck in my head. Uh, visibility, insights, and action. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, we're able to gain visibility with a camera. Uh, you know, fairly straightforward. Uh, it's no different to any other sensor. It just happens to have a lens on it. It's a super sensor, if you like. Uh, the AI models um, that uh, MelTX uh, produces uh, provide the insights from what it's seeing. So uh, from the camera's perspective, it's, it's an object. It doesn't know whether it's a car or a person or a can of soup. 
Um, but the AI models help interpret that data and make inferences. Um, so uh, uh, I'm trying to give a good example, uh, but uh, being able to look at uh, a situation and derive uh, a, a potential need or, or concern that it highlights. And then there's the action piece. Okay, so what are we going to do about that? Um, actually, Rafi mentioned uh, looking at cars in a drive through. Uh, if the if the line is growing, what does that tell you, and mm. what can we do to prevent the what's eventually going to be a drive off, uh, your bulk or abandonment of the line? Uh, so, uh, what action are we going to take? Are we going to dispatch an associate with a handheld to to try and triage the line? Are we going to you know offer promos to get them uh, the customer to select certain things that are going to is going to shorten that uh, service duration? Or are we going to try and divert them to curbside and, and uh, triage the line that way? So uh, that visibility insights and action uh, uh, approach, I think, can be applied to many, many things. Uh, obviously, uh, video analytics is what we're talking about today. Uh, right. But it, it's something worth bearing in mind. There's no shortage of data in retail. Um, <laughs> is it relevant data? Can we derive some insight from it? And then what the heck are we going to do about it once we do? Right. So guys, I have to ask because every time I hear these type of things, um, my immediate response is, well, who, who the heck wouldn't do this? But I'm sure there are people giving you pushback. I'm sure there are people saying, that's ah, not for me. What, 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 are, what are you hearing from customers that are saying that? Sure. What, is our, what is our counter to that? Sure. Well, I think the first pushback is cameras are creepy. I think mm. that's the first one that we hear a lot. You I know, got one in my hey, face right now. I can attest. There you go. Exactly. <laughs> it's, it's, it's looking at me right now. Luckily, this one's not intelligent. It just has a lot of pixels. Um, but the the idea that someone is watching, right? That idea that someone is 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 kind of viewing it, kind of live, if you will, and trying to look about you and trying to figure out what you're doing. It's an interesting approach or it's an interesting kind of feedback because we all have phones in our pockets that are giving an enormous amount of data away on an ongoing basis. The reason why retailers have the opportunity to create personas, I think that we've talked to you probably, probably talked about this before, right? We all have lots of personas that we're associated with, right? There's a whole um, uh, uh, sub practices within agencies that talk about persona mapping uh, effectively against individuals, right? If you buy, like I have, and I'm a proud minivan owner, I should say, right? So if you're a proud <laughs> minivan owner like I am, you are likely to have children. You are likely, if you're in the Midwest, that like I am, and you've got an all-wheel drive, you're probably traveling a lot, right? You've got family in Michigan, right? So there's all these kinds of things that you can assume based on those personas. And because we have those devices that are essentially broadcasting an enormous amount of information about us on an ongoing basis, that there's a lot that the uh, agencies and marketing technology companies have been able to build off of our profiles. Now, a lot has changed because if you are an Apple user, right, um, you are partially responsible for the loss of about 60% of Facebook's market capitalization over the last year. Because you hit that button that says, do not track me across multiple applications. Okay? It's getting a little in the weeds. So I apologize. I'll, I'll bring it back to, 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 to something that's a little bit more relevant here in a second. But um, <clears throat> they used to have ability to say, if you log into Facebook on mobile, on your phone or whatever, you could, they could track you across all kinds of applications. So that's why if you go and you know, look at something on um, Amazon or whatever, and you pop over in the other browser to CNN, all of a sudden there's an ad barking at you. That is the thing that you just looked at. What the heck is that? Well, yeah, because they're tracking you across multiple applications. It was true on your phone as well until Apple changed things and Google did as well. That says do not track across my, my phone effectively, right? So although it's a little bit less intrusive, there is nothing more intrusive in the world that's going to be uh, as your phone effectively, right? Because it's got location data and all the things around you. So that's why we go to great pains to explain to customers that the camera is a sensor and we treat it as a sensor. So although it is video and it is being deployed predominantly for loss prevention, i.e. video storage so that folks that are in law enforcement can look backwards in time to see if something that has happened. What 
we're doing with our AI models is inferencing the video in real time to drive out those insights, right? And to take video, terabytes of data, and turn it into ones and zeros, kilobytes of data, effectively, right? So we are not tied, the way that the technology works is, it's not like we're pulling and taking in tons of raw video on our side uh, in the cloud, and then have a lot of people looking at it and trying to figure out what's going on. We're quite literally doing it at the camera where we can't even see the video. So we don't see it on our side. All we see is metadata being extracted out of that video, and then we're being able to inference that information as well. So that, that was a bit of a tortured explanation, but I think it's important to say <laughs> why cameras can be great sensors and also be privacy compliant. Yeah, there's, there's always been this concern around privacy, whether you're talking about you know, your digital assistant at home, your, your Alexa or your Google, I've got to be careful what I say here because something's going to spark up. Um, uh, and there's this misperception, I think, as with cameras, that somebody is sitting there watching it or listening to it <laughs> or whatever it may be. And, and mm. the reality is it's a, an AI uh, that's looking for specific triggers or, or patterns um, and, and really it's not uh, invading in your privacy. You know, somebody isn't listening to your personal conversations that you're having in front of your digital assistant. So it's, it's one of those perceptions we have to overcome. Yeah. Yeah. So privacy is one of the biggest pushbacks, I would say. Awesome. Awesome. Guys, we are at the... <laughs> That's a short answer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we've got more pushbacks I can give to you, but if, if you want to move on to another topic, more than happy to. No, I mean, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm game to go as deep as we, we all feel comfortable and, and, and want to. Okay. Um, well, folks, I, I do want to remind yeah. everybody that uh, there are going to be a, numerous links uh, down below this video or this audio podcast that you are listening to. Uh, so if you have any further questions or you want a deeper look into anything you are hearing, please click those links below uh, and, and, and feel free to browse. There is also going to be an email address uh, down below. Mark, this is something new that wasn't on the previous podcasts that you know about. Uh, but if you have any questions, please feel free to shoot an email to us with, ask, with those questions, and we will try our best to answer that on an upcoming podcast. Thanks, Rafi. And, and I kind of wanted to also touch on that license plate usage to recognize the cars as well. So we'd love to go into that and get your thoughts on it. Uh, sure. Well, there's two lines of thinking um, that we've been solving for for retailers. One of them is to utilize license plates to be able to create a more frictionless um, system of grocery pickup or license plate to pay in a drive through things along those lines, right? So there's a line of thinking, which is, which is a, a thing that we're pursuing and we're implementing, which is that co consumers want convenience, right? And they're willing to show tell you what their car is and what their license plate is and things along those lines and verify their identity so that when they get to their grocery store or they get to their drive through they can effectively just drive in they get recognized and they drive out right you have to ensure that the security is protected and there's a lot of things that you've got to do in order to uh, uh, meet the security requirements that the retailer has put aside that's absolutely a use case that we can kind of go through and there's ways of doing it there's all kinds of technical ways to do it real time, near real time, all kinds of different things. But there's another line of thinking where there's just want to collect data, again, metadata. So there's a customer that we're working with that um, had required us to not use license plate information, okay? So going back to this idea of training our models and utilizing an ethical approach to artificial intelligence, we said, okay, we're gonna basically fork off our model where we can look at the make and the model uh, of a vehicle, but not look at the license plate, right? Yeah. And we're gonna use the pixels that are available to us to take a picture, right? And then be able to track that picture from camera to camera in a drive-through to be able to get those statistics and that information. But we basically can see the license plate, i.e. the camera sees it, but all it sees is a collection of pictures that. It's sort of like a fingerprint more than anything. And we bring those through in the drive-through. We collect a little bit of data. 
We ensure that that is um, tokenized, so it's encrypted and secure kind of at the edge. And once that car leaves, that token is destroyed and we don't have that information. We don't know who that person is. So we can kind of solve for both use cases and both use cases are valid. Um, and it just kind of depends on what the customer is really asking for. In a lot of cases, it's it's going to come down to whether the, the, the consumer opts in uh, if they see value. 100%. Um, generally, there's a there's a, a something called the plain sight doctrine. Uh, if if you can see it uh, in the streets, then you can use it to identify somebody. And and license plates generally a public record. Uh, however, I completely understand that some retailers and other industries. Uh, may have privacy concerns uh, around that. And moving jurisdiction to jurisdiction, uh, not just in the US, but globally, uh, it, it can vary. Uh, so uh, it's definitely something to be cognizant of, but being able to identify make, model, and color of a vehicle, um, it's, it's perfectly ethical. Uh, but also, as, as Rafi was uh, su suggesting before, uh, you can actually infer certain things uh, from you know, types of vehicles. Oh, my camera just shut off. Sorry. Am I still with you? Yeah, see you. we can see you fine. Huh? <laughs> sorry, Perfect. sorry about that. No, no worries. But, but, oh, I, <laughs> I ran out of space on my hard drive. Excellent. <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, what did that happen? Yeah. Uh, Do your deck before you start, right? Well, it's a it's a, it's a, it's a great point, Mark. It's it's this idea of what are people prepared to accept, mm -hmm. right? And the risk that they're that they in, that they think about when they look at kind of technology deployments. Um, this is really net new stuff. You know, we we are at the 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 cutting edge of this this market right now, but it's only going to increase. Um, I say that, but I think that there's barriers to it. And I think that um, there's some unethical behavior that's out there. There's some um, problematic technology that's been implemented. So I think that what we try to focus on and the reason why we're so invested in our relationship with Cisco um, is, can you get any more trusted from a network perspective than Cisco? And I think the answer is, is no, right? Like, you know, uh, uh, market leaders, and we want to be seen as a market leader. And we also, during our process, when we talk to you know, some of the, the top end, you know, Fortune 500 is we are here from the grace of the platform. We are an application that sits on top of the platform. If we do anything that violates anything from a Cisco perspective, they can turn us off, turn us off globally. So we, we, we are disincentivized from, you know, having any kind of bad behavior or running afoul of any kind of security protocols because it would cripple our business if we did it that way. So that's a pretty good incentive to stay in stay in the lane and uh, over the long term. So I, I have I have a, a question because both you and Mark uh, have touched on this. Uh, you know, you talked about uh, delivery systems, but both of you have touched on the drive through. Uh, yeah. You talked earlier on about people being in in line with their cars and then taken off because it was taking too too long. So so how are we optimizing drive through? I would imagine that's something that we're doing. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think the first part is we're collecting data about what's going on and we're showing insights that were previously unavailable. So the, there's a big shift that happened in the pandemic. A lot of, um, you know, kind of traditional kind of QSRs, if you will, like the McDonald's of the world and folks that have been out for a long time, they've always had this 70-30 split where about 70% of their business is going through drive through about 30% is kind of going in retail. It turns out now that that's effectively industry-wide if not higher in some places. So where people have expected a 50-50 split, it's gone to that 730 and it's really not coming back. So what there's a lot of folks that found themselves earning an enormous amount of money throughout that process because they had that drive through that was available, but they also don't know what's going on out there because their point of sale data is basically an on off switch. Somebody ordered and then somebody delivered. Right. And all the data in, in between is just the big, big blind spot. So the first thing that we're doing is we're identifying what the blind spots are. And then secondarily, we're looking at what are those bulk and abandonment rates? When does the congestion happen? Right. So it's almost like there's this idea. Um, it wasn't an economist, but I will have to look it up of, of the accordion effect. I don't know if you guys have heard about that, but it's it's related to traffic. 
And the accordion effect is effectively, if you've ever done a long distance trip and there's an accident, you know, a quarter mile down the road, but there's nobody blocking the, the uh, lanes at all, you're going to encounter a slowdown because the first person looks and rubbernecks and then the person behind them has to hit the brake and then they rubberneck and then it creates this congestion and then that congestion opens up ahead. So this kind of back and forth, which is an accordion, right? Um, so that's what we're seeing in the drive through We're seeing that accordion effect where you got a tremendous amount of congestion and then it opens up. But then we're starting to look at, okay, what, what were the drivers behind those things? And it turns out that the drivers could be um, a lack of an efficient payment system. It can be, believe it or not, um, large dogs that are in the car that come out and try to poke their head out. The, it's, it actually happens, believe it or not, right? Um, that, that then the uh, person that's serving wants to interact and they're having this great human you know, interaction, human you know, canine interaction, uh, <laughs> and then it, it slows things down, right? Um, but the biggest one is like when, when things become inaccurate or you've got a, a <laughs> I'll go back to the minivan here, you got a minivan with like six kids in it and everybody's got a different order and then it slows it down and then you people start balking away right yeah. so there's a there's a lot of things that are going on that we can say when we look at congestion go back to the example of kind of vision and insights and actions what are the actions that we can take some of the actions that we're looking at is integration with many board systems where you're promoting not items that are you can t traditionally think of quote unquote upsell Right. I'm going to do something that's a little bit higher margin. You're trying to figure out what are the areas that are the easiest to make of which you have the most inventory to be able to get that line moving again, because throughput is critical. Right. In those really kind of peak times within those restaurant environments. So it's a, again, it's a long answer. I, I'm sorry. I'm not giving you good sound bites here. They're, they're longer <laughs> answers, but there's a lot of complexity within those answers. I love it. I love it. Yeah, I mean, Pearl Rafi's example there, you know, in, in terms of the, the, the promo, if you've got line growth and uh, you have a, a bunch of people in the line that are going to order a, a hot sandwich uh, that, you know, maybe is pre-packaged, but it's still got to sit in the microwave for 60 or 90 seconds, uh, and you can send a promo uh, targeted to the, the individual who you know, <clears throat> excuse me, you know is in the line already uh, for, you know, a cold Danish uh, straight out of the coal cabinet, you've just collapsed that line by 60 or 90 seconds. And if you, if you can do that multiple times, uh, shorten the line overall, uh, and then you will see a re reduction in those people pulling out of line. Okay. And, and while we're talking about drive-through, it's actually no different to the, to the line in the grocery store. Um, exactly. uh, you know, we, we're talking about cars, people are objects too. That probably sounds bad. <laughs> I am not an object. <laughs> Don't objectify me. Um, but uh, you know, it, it's it's uh, from from the video's perspective, it is a, an object um, with a predictable movement pattern uh, and pr predictable actions uh, that can come out of uh, you know what the camera is seeing. So you know, you walk up with your cart with three hundred dollars of groceries in and it's five deep at the at the register you know oh, forget this walk away and you're not just losing the revenue that's in the cart you've now got to pay somebody to put that back mm -hmm. uh, and there's also the potential for spoilage you know if there's frozen goods in there and it takes them you know an hour to actually wrestle that cart and, and get the stuff back to where it should be potentially it's defrosted you know, mm. so and you, and you can apply this across multiple segments of retail uh, where uh, you can look at the uh, behaviors uh, that are going to occur. I, I've, I've done this in you know, big box stores uh, where I've, I've walked away from a cart because I couldn't make a phone call. Uh, mm. So there's all sorts of reasons where you can um, uh, potentially detect things like abandonment, uh, not just in the drive through or at the register, but somewhere else in the store. Uh, if a cart is there and it's been sitting there for you know 15 minutes, chances are somebody has walked away and just left that product there, uh, yeah. and you know you can dispatch somebody to to go and deal with that. Yeah, Mark, and I think additionally from that is even brand loyalty, right? Like if I if I know that that store is going to have a long line every time for lunch, I'm going to go somewhere else for lunch, or I'm going to go do my yep. groceries somewhere else. Yeah. 
and, and, and thank and thank you uh, because th this is an area that's so frequently uh, skipped. Uh, you know, we mm. we look at the, the the direct costs. You know, what's the revenue lost, and what's the cost of labor to put that product back on the shelf? But you got the soft costs as well. Uh, and if you go to the marketing department, they will be able to tell you what you know a, a point of loyalty uh, costs for that particular retailer. And each time I abandon my car to walk out the door, um, you know how many points are being lost in that process. That's going to impact not just the single shopping trip, but the lifetime value of the customer uh, if they decide to take their wallet uh, to the the grocery store or the home improvement store down the street because they're not happy with the service they're getting on a on a regular basis. And we've all we've all done that, right? I know I have. Yeah. Oh yeah. You know, I've I've been oh, yeah. to I've been to a Home Depot and I've looked at the quality of the lumber and I'm like, no way, this is ridiculous. You're gonna charge me for that? <laughs> and then I go to Lowe's and then the next six, seven, eight times I'm going for it, I'm thinking about Lowe's first than I am Home Depot, right? I'm just using that as an example. It's not to say that uh, the retailers are, <laughs> they're both great retailers. Um, <laughs> thank you to, to both of them if you're listening. But the, the, point, the point is, is that per perception is real, right? And it's hard to figure out how you measure those different things and what the long-term impact kind of on your business is. We're working with one retailer that, um, uh, uh, they, they were saying, we, we, we always ask the question of what are you currently doing now? Because they look at like, what's the art of the possible with this new technology, quote unquote, new technology. Uh, and then we say, well, what are you doing now? And they go, well, we do surveys. We go, oh, interesting. <laughs> right? Okay. You're doing surveys for people and how long they're waiting. And they're like, I, we go, how accurate do you think that is? And the answer is not accurate at all because there's a perception about the amount of time that you spend in a line or whatever. And that perception could be colored by, I didn't have enough caffeine this morning, or I need to use bathroom or, you know, whatever, right? There's all kinds of things that can modify perception. And what we're trying to show is extremely accurate, right, to the subsecond level of data. And what does that data give you and what actions that you can take on those insights? And, and with surveys, you're trying to extrapolate a very small uh, sample size. Mm -hmm. And the thing to remember with, with retail, particularly in large geographic areas like the US or Europe, um, the, uh, how the brand is perceived is going to vary significantly from uh, area to area. So mm -hmm. a format that works particularly well in the northeast of, of the United States, uh, put that in the deep south, uh, and you'll see a completely different behaviors in there. Uh, I remember Years and years ago, when I first got into into retail, uh, somebody telling me that um, when you see promotional signage outside stores, it has to be varied by market because two for the price of one versus 50% uh, off when you buy two is perceived differently. It's the same math, but it's perceived differently by different uh, demographics, different geographic locations and so on. And this is just a quick reminder for everybody listening. If there is anything that you want a deeper dive in, be sure to check out the links below. They will have lots of information on everything you are hearing here. Um, guys, I have, a, I have a question for you. And, and, and uh, we're talking about all this and, and you know, simplistic Danny Brain says this is pretty cool and futuristic, but there's got to be something on the horizon. Where, where are we headed? What's, what's, what's in the future for us? Oh, Mark's better at predicting than I am. <laughs> <laughs> if, if, if i did that i'd be in vegas rappy um, <laughs> um boy it, it, it's it's a difficult one to answer because technology is moving quickly ai is moving quickly typically retailers don't honestly move as quickly um we we saw you know a very um rapid forced innovation cycle uh, during the pandemic. Uh, we saw lots of um, retailers running out to uh, either deploy or enhance their curbside and, and drive through capabilities. And, and to an extent, that's why Rafi and I tend to uh, probably focus heavily on, on the drive through because uh, we saw a problem uh, during the pandemic uh, where you know lines were backing out onto the street, and you know the the, the market was desperate for a, for a solution. Um, 
but uh, you know, we're, we're seeing a slowing of that innovation and can, uh, retailers are now taking a step back and going, okay, we, we deployed a lot of stuff uh, during that period. Is it still valid? And mm-hmm. how can we, uh, in some cases, kind of uh, shore up or reinforce uh, what we've done? We've, we've decided it was the right thing. Uh, now, how do we uh, consolidate and, and refocus on that? So I think we're going to see a lot of the use cases we've talked about and things we've we've seen in the last uh, two and three years um, become more prevalent within the industry. Um, I think you'll probably get fewer um, innovators kind of leaping ahead. Uh, but that said, you know, uh, Rafi, I, I, I don't know how much detail you can go into we, we were having an sure. interesting conversation the other day about hyper personalization mm. and how we can uh, get to a point where uh, we're, we're not just looking at you know historical uh, spend data in the in the crm or loyalty system uh, but we can look very specifically at how consumers are interacting um, with the store with fixtures with the objects in the store uh, being able to do uh, targeted um, engagement, and I, I, I want to get away from thinking about promos because you know promos right. sound like yeah we're just trying to sell you more. Um, right. it, it's, right. it's really about engagement because uh, I think ultimately the the, the winner in this whole um, environment is going to be the retailer that serves their customer best, uh, mm-hmm. and it's going to as Sabrina brought up, it's going to drive that loyalty because. Consumers will pay a little more for a superior experience, uh, and in a in a very um, vanilla uh, world, uh, it's those retailers that stand out are, that are really going to succeed. Uh, and to do that, they need to understand their customer better. Rafi, I don't know yeah. if you have any well, thoughts on that. I, I would say, you know, I mean, it's 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 a dangerous business to be in long term prognostication, but I would say short term. <laughs> The bet that we're making, right, uh, is is exactly to that point, uh, Mark, is that if we're looking at um, how everyone is looking at how much square footage they own, whether it's a retail environment or a corporate environment or whatever, right? They're trying to figure out how much of the, the space we need. If you want to take a grocery store, for example, how much of we need to be able to carve out to make effectively micro fulfillment centers? so that we can keep the fresh stuff fresh and then bring it out to be able to put into a car that's actually gonna get delivered, right? And that stuff just gets, it gets wobbly. It, 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 there's no straight lines in any part of this business where it just kind of goes. It goes month to month, quarter to quarter and consumer shopping and behavior happens. Uh, it's a, like a whiplash. It goes back and forth and happens all the time. So our big bet is that real time actionable data and having that data available um, is really the the new kind of gold rush because that ten billion dollars and the sixty percent market value that came off facebook it 's not like marketers are not spending that those dollars in different places like we 've seen I used to be in the digital signage business and, and to some extent we kind of still are because we 're looking at you know the efficacy of signage but um, the digital out of home business in particular is growing like gangbusters because when people are outside it 's showing you there 's a big screen that 's in on the side of the road, people look at it and it influences behavior, right? But if you can't really target and look at that phone and be able to do those targeted conversions like buyers have been spending a, the better part of a decade doing, they're looking for other things that they can measure to be able to show a, a real physical click to convert, if you will, right? A mouse click in a, a physical environment, a mouse hover, those are things like where people's hands are and how they're engaging and do they put it in the basket? Because we can look at, say, okay, do you want to give us the point of sale data? We can say where people have moved and the things that they've interacted with and did it actually end up being paid for or not, right? And that level of data is, is much more than you would get when you're online. So our, our bet in the, in the short term and I guess short to medium term is that data is the currency of retail and that's where we want to be. Yeah, and I, as you were talking there, Rafi, I, I was coming back in my head to um, how I generally open up a presentation when I'm, I'm talking to a retailer, 
Uh, and it's really about how can you be an agile retailer? Mm. Um, because as you say, it, it, it's, it's the whims and vagaries of, of consumer demand, uh, but it's also the um, business landscape. Nobody could have foreseen uh, what was going to happen over the last three years. Um, and so you had the business landscape change. And on top of that, uh, and in part, in part because of that, um, the consumer demand changed as well. So be, being able to uh, get that real-time or near real-time data helps you uh, be agile and respond uh, to those customer uh, demands and, and changing landscapes. Whatever the next what, wave may Whatever be. the next thing is. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Hopefully, hopefully nice. Yeah. yeah. Well, guys, I know we are up against the time slot, and I want to be conscious of, of the, the a lot of time that you gave us. Um, and we are approaching my favorite um, time of the podcast. And Mark, you've already joined the podcast, so you know the secrets out of the bag. But Rafi, this is new for you. Uh, and so I, I like to tell everybody, if you are like me, you join a podcast and you, the night before, think in your head of all the crazy questions that I may ask you or that Sabrina may ask you. And because we throw scripts on the ground in the very beginning of podcasts, I don't ask those questions. And so this is your open opportunity. What should the audience know that maybe I haven't asked you or that one nugget, if there's one nugget that they should walk away from this podcast with, what is that? And Mark, same question to you. So get ready because we're coming to you. I would say that um, we are fanatically committed to finding the places that are a little strange where maybe a, a vendor hasn't gone before and that we can spin up new use cases around. We love to find those little niches within markets that have been previously uh, uncovered or unexplored. And we can find them and then deliver immediate value out of. Um, we have the ability to move very, very, very fast um, if the resources are committed the right way. And we can find those kind of nuggets of information that allows us to unlock a tremendous amount of business value. So we try to focus less on products and more on the solution. Um, and I think that that's what it is. I mean, we, I spent a lot of time talking, like I mentioned before, and there's a reason. <laughs> because if you don't have an honest communication going on with your customers and you don't ask about what problems they're facing and you can't get that level of trust, you're never going to find what your value proposition is, right? So that's, that's what I think is important about us is that we're veterans and that we really look to find the places where we can drive the uh, business value that may not have been uncovered previously. Beautiful. I, I should have known it was coming, Danny, and I, I <laughs> didn't. Uh, so I think I, I come back to uh, something we, we, we frequently say when we're talking to, to customers, and, and they're, they're trying to wrap their heads around what the heck is video analytics and computer vision. And there's a lot of expertise uh, out in retail, uh, but it's generally not um systemic or inter inst institutionalized i can't even say it institutionalized um so if you were to take one of your most experienced managers and sit them up on a shelf at the, at the front of the store and, and look down on the store what would they see what would they notice this gives us the opportunity to to some degree institutionalize that knowledge uh, so that it becomes just part of the process. Nobody even thinks about it or notices it. Um, if and, and Rafi can correct me if I'm wrong here, but generally, <laughs> if we can see something, then we can probably analyze it. Uh, yep. And uh, if we can take that knowledge uh, from those experienced professionals in, in the industry, uh, and actually, I, I should I should add a piece in here. You know, the number one challenge today in the in the retail market is labor. So, you know, not only are we losing associates, we are losing um, the experienced, you know, store leadership, etc. And um, so, we need to be able to take that knowledge and uh, replicate it through the systems so that other people don't have to. That's great. Love it. Love it. Love it. Well. 
Uh, guys, I, I want to thank you for your time uh, and and conversation. I think I learned quite a bit. I, I won't speak for Sabrina. She's far smarter than I, uh, but uh, God knows I learned quite a bit. I think our customers did as well. Uh, to our customer, to the folks listening in the audience, uh, again, just one last reminder. If you have any questions, please feel free to email us, and we will try to get that in an upcoming podcast. Uh, and if you want a deeper dive into anything you heard, click the link down below and take a tour on whatever URLs are down there. Guys, thank you so much again. I hope to have you both on the podcast once again. Sabrina and I, thank you all for listening. Thank you very much.